experience both in terms of ceremonial life, he's uh, been uh, uh, practicing ceremonies for the last 30 years, but before that was well known also in terms of uh, working in, in political circles, he was a chief at one time and at the national level, and uh, so uh, you know, he's a, a real, uh, uh, a real vast resource of, uh, of insight and uh, wisdom. So I've uh, told uh, Alistair so like a bit about what we've been talking about in class, and um, I'm going to ask him to talk for 30, 40 minutes and have questions. But, I, but before that, I thought just a few things. Um, one is um, um, that uh, after the class, this, um, this has to be me now, <laughs> there's a, what's called the Saskatchewan Book Awards ceremony going on in Kempton, and I've been invited because one of the books I wrote about the Buffy City and he's actually been short so he asked me to go. So after the class, uh, everyone is invited. As a matter of fact, they said, I want to let the class out of and invite them over. And he says, not with the elders here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just, just to mention that. And uh, uh, the final thing is I thought if we just go around the room and just uh, just give our names so we can start like it knows who we are. And just that's the next step here. What would it be? residential school for 11 years and uh, I got my uh, common experience payment I got $40,000 for that uh, I spent you know, a lot of it on my kids and my grandkids and uh, bought a few things like tires for my truck and <laughs> stuff like that a computer all gone. That was it. And then, uh, oh, paid some of my debts off, my credit cards and stuff. Then uh, 
After that, uh, we start hearing a lot about this independent assessment process and that had to do with people who were uh, abused. And uh, all those years, I didn't know that uh, that this process was available. So I went through it. I got compensation for that. I had a lawyer uh, who was not he was scrupulous or not. But anyway, it ended up the bank took 40000 off me. So I'm fighting for that now. And, uh, I have to use the white man's way, their court system, I go to ceremonies to ask for help from the creator and grandfather's grandfather to help me out in this. So, uh, there's that. There's, there's a lot to be said about this spirituality. Like, uh, spirituality doesn't just go to indigenous people or First Nations people. Christian people can be spiritual too. And I always say that uh, my grandfather and grandmother. I was quite surprised. I was a little boy. I used to see them going to churches, different churches. And I wondered, you know, how come? Muslim, how come you're going to that church? <laughs> say, because they believe in God with people. And so uh, that was a true tolerance of, uh, of other people and how they prayed. And uh, they didn't like become converted or anything like that. They just went out of respect for those people. And uh, I found that very strange. Uh, but uh, I didn't understand it then. But I understand it now why, why they did that. And uh, it all had to do with spirituality. And I speak to a lot of groups uh, on behalf of the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. I speak to church groups. I speak to the RCMP. I speak to uh, indigenous studies classes such as this, uh, so Kern, Weber, and Esteban, Yorkton, all over the place. Uh, I spoke to a, an ecumenical uh, meeting of, uh, of church people, uh, all different religions. And uh, so I do a lot of speaking. I've been doing this for about five years now. And, uh, You know, how in the linear mind you have to have everything just so, you know, you write it down, there's a paragraph, there's a page, and there's three or four pages of your presentation. Uh, I've chosen not to do that. I've chosen to look at, to, to speak as I have in the past five years in a certain sphere. Uh, when I talk about treaty, I talk about the covenant of treaty. So you can talk about treaty from a legal point of view and people have taken treaty to court. You can talk about <laughs> it from a political point of view. Uh, and, and I've done a lot of that too. You can speak uh, about treaty from a uh, uh, contract point of view when it was a legal binding contract. You can speak about treaty from a spiritual point of view. And I've done all of those things. and. Uh, Lately in my life, I've been talking about treaty from a spiritual point of view. Uh, you know, if, you, if you've ever been down to Fort Capel, you see that beautiful teepee, uh, that governance center. Uh, you see that hospital, multi-millions of dollars. And uh, I remembered uh, that my great-great-grandfather, Wapi Mustasis, was a signatory to that treaty. And uh, he was uh, very, like in those days, these leaders were spiritual men. And uh, uh, they weren't political. Today, most of our leaders are political, basically political, less spiritual. There are some who are sp spiritual, but most of them are just, are just political. So uh, I, I hearken back to the days when my great-great-grandfather was living. He was a truly spiritual man with some political bent. And uh, then my great-grandfather, Star Blanket, Chako uh, Sadotako, that was his name. Uh, it doesn't mean Star Blanket. Uh, white people called him that. It 
Hachagos is a starter the sky. The taco a bit like a, a covering, like a cover, covering wood. So they translated it to star black. And uh, so that's how I got my name. Uh, my grandfather, my dad's father was a star blanket son. Uh, he was a, a spiritual man only. He was not a political man. He was. Uh, he just did all the, the spiritual ceremonies and uh, picked medicines with him. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> picked medicines with them. Uh, my grandparents and it took me 50 years to get back to that. When I was a very little boy. I was picking medicines with him. And then I went into residential school and I went into politics. I did all those wild and crazy things that Indian politicians used to do, and some of them still do. <laughs> but, uh, I drank and I caroused and I did all those things. And then, uh, uh, of course, uh, previous 11 years to that, I was abused in an Indian residential school, which was supposedly a spiritual school. Okay, so somewhere along the line, they got that their spirituality mixed up. And I asked some Christian friends of mine, some Jewish friends of mine also, uh, you know, who are these people that, uh, there was a film just released here, the late uh, Glenny Anna, but we were children, and how he was abused in an Indian residential school, and the thing that stuck in my mind was this, what kind of a God do these people have that they would allow their administrators to do things like that? Good question. You know, just found an answer to that. But uh, that's how spirituality can can you know go off the tracks. And not just white Christianity or white spirituality. Our people do that too. We're not immune from that. You have heard stories here about people, uh, lodgemen getting charged and going to jail. Uh, supposedly spiritual people. So we're not immune to that. And uh, it takes a, a great deal of discipline to follow a truly spiritual, positive lifestyle. And it's hard. It's not an easy thing uh, to, to grasp that. And the, the, the disciplines that are associated with, with my kind of spirituality, what I was taught by my grandparents, uh, it's very harsh. Uh, very harsh discipline. It's like uh, in my discussions with other groups, I often refer to a book called uh, The Mystic Warrior of the Plains, something like that. And it's by Thomas Males, M A I L S. This book, it's about four inches thick, great big book, big heavy book. My daughter has that, and uh, I, I, I uh, leaf through it here years ago and uh, uh, it, he was an anthropologist and he studied uh, back in the uh, 1800s uh, the different uh, Native American groups that he met with and, uh, that he encountered and that he studied studied their ritual studied their ceremony studied their uh, their way of life studied their accoutrement their dress their philosophies all of that and he wrote about it. It's quite interesting. Uh, like he, uh, for example, uh, and I often use this uh, uh, to illustrate the people I talk to. Uh, they had, they had a, their own systems, whether it was economic, whether it was justice, whether it was spiritual, whatever. They had a, a system. And uh, in this regard, uh, I, I, I refer to this. Their discipline was such that uh, certain of these tribes, if you had a, a partner, a spouse, uh, and you cheated on that spouse, that partner, they would cut off a part of your face, your nose or something. So as a result, we didn't have a lot of people going around with uh, little, little noses, you know, <laughs> because they were very uh, they were disciplined by that. Similarly, uh, if you stole something, had a piece of your uh, finger cut off. 
So you didn't have a lot of people going around missing one finger or whatever because they followed that justice system. So things like that, and I found that to be very interesting. Today, we don't care. You know, we steal, we cheat on our partners, we do all those things. Yeah, I know, I did that. <laughs> so uh, uh, that would have been going around without a nose and <laughs> missing lots of fingers or whatever, you know. But uh, uh, that was like, you know, we talk about the justice system and, uh, and uh, you know, we have to follow the, the justice system out here. And uh, uh, we're always complaining about how harsh it is. Well, you know, where we came from, uh, our spiritual connection back to those early years, heck, we wouldn't even survive if we had to live. Uh, if we left this life and went and lived in that life right now, we wouldn't be able to survive. You know, and things like when you had to go and uh, fast, uh, when you reached the age of puberty as a young man, you were, you were sent into the bush. Think about it if you're, if you're uh, 11, 12 years old and you're sent to a bush to be by yourself to fast and to pray. That would be scary, scary. But there are a few people that do it today. Not many, but a few. I know of some. Similarly with girls. Uh, you know, like uh, I always told my son, I have one son. I always told him, don't ever hit a woman. You know, he's a young guy, macho, walking around, solid, all that, you know. And uh, he used to wrestle with girls. Just in fun. I don't, no, don't do that. Don't even touch a girl like that in jest. Because it's uh, very, very serious. Women are very, very serious in our culture, our spirituality. And the reason is this, that they, uh, they bear children. They bring life. And... Uh, the only other entity that can do that is the Creator. So that's why we were a girl, women. I was just at the Johnny Public School Board here uh, for the last two days, yesterday and the day before, and I spoke to a group of teachers who are going out to teach treaty in their schools. And I talked to them very much like this. And I speak to them about, you know, the women, the women's role the men's role, like, for example, in treaty signing, and how uh, the men were all concerned uh, about bricks, and, uh, we all say this, bricks and mortar. In other words, we want a school on every reserve, you know, good stuff. And uh, but when they went back at night to their camps, their elders, men and women, they asked them, is there anything that we forgot? Is there anything you want us to say? want to add to what we, this is what we told these white treaty negotiators. And uh, it was the women who stood up and said, we want you to think about these things. And I think uh, to talk about them, one of them was, as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, the rivers flow, etc. And what did that mean? Did that mean uh, the treaty would come to an end on December 31st, 2013? No. It meant this treaty would last in perpetuity. And that was a contribution by the women. Just because the women did not uh, stand up and negotiate a treaty didn't mean they did not have an input. Because I always tell white people this, you know, we, as First Nations indigenous peoples, we don't believe in equality. And everybody goes, <gasps> how come you don't believe in equality? What's wrong with you people? You know, because we believe in a true spiritual way that women are better than us men. And we hold them on a pedestal. That's why, like, uh, for example, Anishinaabe people, they don't have women in their sweat lodges because the women are too powerful to be in a man's sweat lodge. Women have ways of of cleansing themselves, us men don't have that. That's why we go into a sweat lodge. And so, uh, you know, today, uh, we, in certain ceremonies, we allow women to sit with us. In the, in the old Cree way, we didn't have women coming in with us too. But now, we have equality, okay? So in other words, the women come with us. That's equality. 
that's linear thinking, that's white people's thinking. And when we think in our way, they were above us. We've been told that so many times in ceremonies. Us men, it's up to us to go and help those women to help them. So uh, I, I coined a phrase which I use. Uh, I do a lot of work with the uh, Wapi Muslims in Helix Center in the Brexit. And uh, I talk like this uh, to those people who come through there whose lives are broken. <coughs> and I, I don't make judgments about them. I just say, okay, you've lost this, you've lost your track, you're coming in to, to find these things again. This is what I know. This is what I'll, I'll share with you. And it's about these women's teachings. And uh, in 2003, I rode a horse from uh, Vernon, B.C. to Sioux Valley, Manitoba. 2,000 kilometers. It took, it took us 49 days. I was 250 pounds on that ride. Pity that poor horse. You know? <laughs> but uh, I lost all that weight. This morning I got on a weight scale, I was 148 pounds. I lost all that weight. And that comes from the, the spiritual ride, the horse spirit. Today I have about 15 horses at home. And uh, we use them in horse dance ceremonies. And uh, we sing to them, we pray to them, we ask them to pray for us. We take medicine from them. I was given the privilege of taking medicine from horses, and I take it and I use it. I'll give that to me. He passed away. In fact, we just honored him here uh, last weekend. He was the one who gave me that, that ability, that gift. Uh, I didn't want to take it uh, at first because I wasn't sure what he, who he was talking to. He was sitting in a surf lodge and he said, somebody here has horses. So I didn't want to be bold. He said, that's me, that's me. I, you know, I just sat there, kept quiet. I thought maybe somebody had horses. So nobody, nobody put their hand up or anything. So he asked again the second time. Somebody near has horses, he said. And I waited a few seconds. Nobody answered, so I just put up and that's me. Come to the front here, he said. So I went and sat and turned beside him. And he, he, uh, he gave me a cigarette. And he said, uh, I'm going to give you something. Okay. I'll he said that those things that those horses have here on their legs, that's their medicine. He said. When you go on a horse dance, he said those horses go around that lodge, around those singers, and they drop their medicine on that path. So people will walk on that path after. It's a, a medicine trail. And human beings can take that. So, so soon after he said that, we, had, we were having ceremonies in, in La uh, the chicken dance, the ghost dance, the rattle ceremony, and the horse dance. And uh, the old man came down from Sweetgrass to teach us about these ceremonies. They did it for four years. And uh, the old man said, okay, it's time. Because I had put my horses in that horse dance, they said, no. You gotta, you gotta take this dance, this horse dance, these rituals, these songs, these prayers, everything. You gotta take it. And it's just like threw a great big heavy stone on my back. I don't know how it felt. It very, very heavy. And uh, so I, I said, okay, uh, I'll do that. So I have to go and see them now. I have to go and get those prayers and those, those uh, songs. Uh, 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 when I first got them there, my, uh, me and my brother had them together. And when we, uh, he went away to a powwow one weekend and he said, Nisa, I'm going go to go to a powwow. He said, I want you to look after the horses. All right. I said, so I was on a Thursday night. He was going on Friday to get there for Friday night. So I was probably home and I took my drum and my dad and smudged up and went down the And uh, so they saw me, uh, you know, they kind of looked at me and they looked away, ignored me, you know, and I thought, all right. I picked up my, my rattle and my drum and I started singing. <coughs> And then it goes 
got it's a, like a, an Indian pony, and it's like the creator talking to you. Uh, my grandson, my grandchild, this horse that's carrying me, that's what the creator says, and then it goes on. Uh, the creator says, this horse spirit is half thunderbird, and then it goes on. It says, uh, his his spirit is half thunderbird. That's what the old people said. He will. And then he, he says, this horse, this Indian pony that's carrying you and me. So, uh, when I started singing that song to those horses, those horses looked up at me and they gathered around me. And, uh, you know, they were pushing me like that with their noses, you know, like letting me know that I was, they were acknowledging me, the horse spirit. So the second verse, and, uh, when I sang it, they got down on their knees, all of them. And uh, we had about eight or ten at that time. And then uh, the third verse, they put their heads right down, they were lying down on the ground. And the fourth verse, uh, an eagle came up from the south, and uh, our second one came up. They flew around us. And, and, uh, fifth verse, one went west, the other one went north. And I thought, this is a spiritual event. I thought, I didn't, I didn't cause this, I didn't create this. This is something from somewhere else. So, uh, I thank the Creator, Grandfathers, Grandmothers that, that would have for me. So I told my brother-in-law about that and uh, nothing in 2009, my uh, brother passed away. He was a chief for 35 years. And uh, so we used our horses, five of four with riders, one rider, we put a star blanket on. And that, one, that was, was for my brother's spirit to ride that horse. And it was a sorrel mare, one of my most beautiful horses. And uh, they were waiting at the main reserve. We had to come up from the wreck about 25 miles. And these horses were very jumpy, they were jittery. And, uh, the riders were having a hard time to hold them back. And so, uh, anyway, the procession got there, and the boys, my nephews, jumped in the back of the truck and they started singing the song. The horses settled right down, and started walking towards that cemetery. And when they got to the cemetery, they stood alongside the, the gravesite. And, uh, they did all the prayers and everything, and then the casket started to go down, and those horses all whinnied in succession, one by one, all five of them. One, two, three, four, five. And we had put feathers and ribbons in their manes, and some of them dropped their feathers and their ribbons, and they were asking them, what should we do with these? And they said, you put, put them away, put, or you put them on your drum, put them in your vehicle, in your house, so they did that. And, uh, so that horse has a spirit. And uh, like, uh, uh, so, does, so do animals, like a dog, for example. Uh, when my, uh, my young niece passed away, my daughter was in the house, and we had uh, curtains, which were, you know, shears, and then a dark the dark ones were open, just, just the shears were there. And we were sitting in a house and we had a little white dog that was a family pet. A very friendly little dog, clean little dog. And my, my daughter was uh, 12 or 14 at the time. And, uh, so we had uh, buried my niece. We were sitting in the living room. And all of a sudden this little dog started running, barking animatedly ran to the window, run over there and run back, run over there and run back. And she said, what's happening? What's wrong? All this shit's pretty concerned. And I told her, close those blinds. And she closed them. She said, what just happened? I said, yeah, I said, what's good? She has to come around to say goodbye. Oh, she said, that's why you have to respect the night and you close your Lines don't leave your windows open because the spiritual world is around. It abounds at night. So that's why you have to respect the night. You know, another example.
example, my granddaughter stayed with me last summer and she had one of her cousins with her. So we have a, the basement windows are half in the ground and half up. And she had the window open. But she and her cousin were sitting there and they were giggling and laughing away, having fun. And all of a sudden she came running upstairs, Muscle! What's wrong? I said, I knew she was frightened. She said, there's somebody downstairs. So I went down. Sure, I said well after asking the ceremony, but that's a spirit. Probably that you uh, This uh, voice she heard was a woman clearing her throat and uh, calling her name. Her name is Sage. Sage. <coughs> Sage. So we asked in a ceremony this day for her. That was her grand, great grandmother who had passed away. And we had given her a pipe, and that, that old lady was coming to tell her to see her. Not to hurt her, just to see her, just to remind her that uh, she's here at the U of R, and uh, she's 18 years old. She got a stud in her, uh, not only pierced and put things in your nose or whatever. <laughs> and then she got one in her cup. And I came into the city with her mother and her brother and we usually take her out for supper or something. She was laughing, going, ah, 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 and the thing was sticking out. And I her, What's that you got on your tongue? She turned away, she didn't want to look at me. She said, She knew. sacred ritual amongst our people. You don't just do that just because other people are doing it. There's a ceremony for that. And for I had uh, given uh, skin offerings before Christmas to that lady chief that was on a hunger strike for those chiefs that were fighting the government for those young people in Idle no more. Great rewards, not no money, not monetary rewards. Uh, you know, no great, uh, uh, you know, significant events or anything like that. You, you don't expect that in a spiritual life to live a spiritual life. Uh, eventually and ultimately, you will receive something in return for what you do. Like for example. The healing center there, they asked me to, to do their sweat lodges and pipe ceremonies and things like that for them. And I speak to them as an elder and uh, different things that I do for them. Each time they give me tobacco and sometimes they give me money. And for example, uh, they gave me $137.60. I don't know how they figured that, but anyway, that's what they gave me in a little check do a sweat lodge ceremony. And out of that, I pay uh, my helper, uh, who is my pipe hander. I pay the rock man. Uh, anybody else that sings with me, I give them maybe 20. But by the time I'm finished, I have nothing. All I have is tobacco. So I'm happy to do that, you know, because uh, I'm helping other people, and they're helping me. And uh, I always ask people to pray for me. That's what I want most out of this, because of you know, they always say, our old people say, don't pray for yourself. Somebody else will pray for you. Uh, so, uh, that's how I, that's how I live, that's how I do things. And, uh, 
there was many people that have come through that healing center that still have contact with them. Some of them from Canada, some of them from uh, the northern line there, Wagatuk uh, area, some of them from Regina. Uh, I even get calls from uh, Vancouver, BC, some of our people live over there. And uh, texting and what have you. And this one young lady phoned me one day and she said, I need to go to see an elder. I need prayers from an elder. Okay. She said, I live at such and such in Regina. Come and pick me up. All right. Came into Regina. She gave me tobacco. I went to I took, the, took her out to pipe up. There's elders there. Gathered a couple of them. I gave them tobacco. This young lady needs prayers. I said, she'll tell me. So she told them. And when we finished, we went back to the giant. She got out of the car, walked into her house, and I said, see you again. And that was it. I did that for tobacco. Uh, of course, I understood her situation. She, she didn't have a lot of money. She had to <coughs> stuff like that. I understand that. But at the same time, like you have to balance that. I always say to people, you know, these elders, sometimes that's all they have. Uh, they have their their uh, old age security, that's all they have. And very often, because they're kind and humble, they spend a lot of that on their kids and their grandkids. But they don't have a lot. So try and help them as much as you can with money or whatever. Uh, just to help them. And then uh, the other thing I tell people is, uh, you, you go to see an elder in a ceremony or whatever if you're very sick or some or one of your relatives is very sick and that elder helps them and I say you know think about it how much is life worth how much would you pay if you went to somebody and say give me my life back how much would you be prepared to pay for that uh, so I say balance that with you know with the tobacco that's what I tell people. For me, like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm fortunate that I have, uh, on top of old age security, I have other organizations that are willing to help me, such as Blair here. <laughs> uh, you know, and I appreciate that. I don't ask for that. I take what's given to me. I don't say, well, you only gave me $100 here. I expected $500. You know, <laughs> you never talk like that when you, when you try to follow this rate. So, uh, accept what you're given. Uh, for others, like others, uh, they'll say, uh, Oh, I charge 1500 for a uh, <coughs> night lodge ceremony. Oh, I charge 750 for a sweat lodge. Stuff like that. Uh, that's not the way I grew up. That's not the way I was taught. <coughs> uh, my grandfather had people coming to him from all over northern United States and western Canada. And he said, we spent a lot of money to get here. So if you just had to go, oh, I understand. And, uh, very often that's how he, how he worked, how he did it. I saw my grandfather heal people, and he healed me too. Things that happened to me in my young life. So uh, in that sense, spirituality, you know, the, the gifts, the blessings that people have, that are, they've been given as they... Uh, as they grow and develop in their spiritual life. Uh, okay. All right, I'll stop there, but like I can talk and talk and talk and talk about this stuff. Okay, because a lot of experiences. I've gone to a, all kinds of different elders trying to find my, my spirit. I've gone to Anishinaabe elders in Marathon, Ontario. I've gone to Lakota elders in, in uh, Pine Ridge, I've gone to Shushwag elders in BC, uh, northern Manitoba, northern Saskatchewan, northern Alberta, all over the place. Uh, Nakoda, Dakota, Lakota, Anishinaabe, Shushwag, Pilgan, I even ceremonialize with uh, Blackfoot people. who are supposed to be our deadliest enemies, but I, I went to a ceremony with them. You know, just to show you that we 
we all believe in the same thing. So, uh, uh, and then gradually as I gained all this knowledge over the years, I started to come to stay closer to home. I found people here that I believe in, that I trust, uh, that I respect, and I started to find those people and I started to go to them. And then I started to prepare down to my own grief. Uh, I go to other ceremonies, like I have relatives in Camp Sack. I've been in ceremonies with them in the last year. And uh, I go to other ceremonies from time to time. But mostly I go to pre-ceremonies because that's where my pipe comes from and that's where I, uh, uh, I feel most comfortable with the language and the ceremony. And even amongst like uh, a, a nation, uh, each nation like say the Cree nation, go to Kawagatos, maybe their ritual is a little different. You go to Sweetgrass, maybe their ritual is a little different. You go to File Hills, maybe their their ritual is a little different. So they all have geographic differences. Like for example, in a, a feast, in Sweetgrass, those old men will, will send around a, a little vessel. And they'll say, everybody put a little bit of your food in that. It goes right around the room like that. We don't do that down here, down south. That we just uh, the elder takes everything up, a little bit of that food, and the elder pays it, there, as opposed to sending it around. You know, and uh, uh, I found that uh, we digress sometimes here too in uh, in the south. I've, I've, beg uh, I've begun to see pork in our some of our foods that we serve. And our old people originally said, no, no pork, just beef or buffalo or wild meat. But uh, then, you know, we got to see pork sneaking into the foods that are offered. It's not right, you know, that's not the way I was taught. And there's very strict uh, discipline to adhere to when we do some kind of ceremonies. And that's part of the teaching of spirituality, that discipline. You know, you have a discipline here. Uh, in First Nations University, you have a class starts at one o'clock. They have to be there at one o'clock until a certain hour. And that's a discipline. Uh, you have to develop that discipline. If you don't, you won't, you won't get a mark. <laughs> so it's the same thing, uh, you know, not unlike spirituality. Uh, there's disciplines you have to follow. And some of the, uh, some of the old people are very strict, uh, stricter in some places than others. Like for example, some people. Like uh, in, a, in a Sundance, uh, you can't wear uh, false teeth. Definitely don't wear glasses and no earrings or anything like that. Uh, some places uh, they will allow you to keep your false teeth in. And then they allow you to chew gum, you know? Okay. So it's different everywhere. Uh, but, you know, the premise is the same. What is spirituality about? Spirituality is about life. And they all say in ceremonies, you're going there, you're paying for life. That's one of the key things in spirituality, it's all about life. And uh, whatever you hear now, they pray, that's what they're praying for, for life. Maybe for all of you, maybe for somebody that asked for certain prayers, somebody that's sick or whatever. It's always about <coughs> life, and that's what the ceremonies, and that's what spirituality is about. That's what the Creator is about. That's what women are about. And uh, so, you know, when, when we respect the Creator, we respect women, uh, then we're respecting life. So that's, I guess, the most important thing about, uh, I guess, any uh, First Nation or indigenous uh, population, uh, uh, religious, spiritual belief. And, uh, Spirituality that we follow, that's our, that's our religion, okay? A lot of people shy away from calling it a religion. That's our religion. Those are our beliefs. Just like Catholics have their way, the United Church has their way, Anglicans have their way, Jehovah's have their way, Buddhists, Jews, they all have their way. And uh, what I grew up with was, as I began to tell you here, 
my grandfather and grandmother went to all these different churches. They'd bring their tent, tent groups to our, our uh, reserve, and my grandparents went there just out of respect to them, and that's called tolerance. Like, uh, I worked with Dr. Matthew Kulka, the Assembly of First Nations National Chief, and he's a devout Christian. Okay? Uh, he doesn't believe what I believe. At one time, we're, because the majority of our people used to pipe, we had a pipe ceremony, and I sat beside him. He sat beside me, he told me. So I sat beside him, and that pipe came. He's, they don't smoke in his religion. So he asked me, no, do I have to smoke this pipe? I said, you don't have to smoke. I said, as long as you touch that pipe and you hold it and you pray the way that you know how. I said, you touch it to a part of your body, whether your head, your shoulder, or your lips, or your heart, or whatever. I said, do that. And you don't have to smoke it. I said, you will have honored that pipe and those people that prayed with that pipe. I said, that's true tolerance. Well, I can do that, he said. Good. And I told him, similarly, when you pray the way that you pray, I respect the way you pray. If you're going to pray with these people for the things that our people are asking for, for treaty rights, for recognition, and for all of those things, I said, I respect you for doing that. So do that. And that's true tolerance. And, uh, that's what uh, my grandparents believed in. That's what they passed on to me, and that's what I passed on to people. Uh, others are not as tolerant as I am. And, uh, uh, on both sides, there's some, some Christian people who call us down, uh, call us pagans and heathens. Uh, we, we worship the dark. We, we, we pray at night in the dark and stuff like that. And we pray to the Prince of Darkness, all that stuff. That's okay, I'll just pray for those people. And then there are others in our group who say, uh, oh, we don't want any white people here, and, uh, you know, white people shouldn't be here. They took our land, they took our la uh, language, and now they want to take our ceremonies, and stuff like that, you know. So you got to be, you got to try and balance that, you know. But, uh, I always say, uh, the white people, uh, they're welcome in, our, in my sweat anytime. You might stick out like a sore thumb, but you're welcome anyway, I <laughs> said. So, I was going to chuckle out of that. And, uh, so, I'll stop there. And uh, if you have any questions or whatever, please, please uh, ask away. Yeah? Uh, why didn't you use uh, pork? Sorry? Pork. Because pork was never part of our culture. It was never part of uh, any of our ceremonies. Buffalo and then now later beef. And uh, I guess because of the, the hoop, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, never really understood that, but I just followed it. Uh, but never been part of our culture, or our prayers, or anything like that. So that's why. Uh -huh. um, last year I went to this um, Aboriginal storytelling conference. Yes. It was hosted by the Saskatchewan Writers Guild. Yeah. And Roger Ross was speaking, and he was holding up a bag of tobacco that was picked. Yeah. And he says, this uh, is natural. It doesn't cause cancer. Then he has a pack of smokes, and he says, this causes cancer, right? This is what gives people problems. And I was just wondering, uh, today, like, people smoke cigarettes, like, endlessly. Yeah. And I was just wondering, you know, uh, is that disrespectful? Because, like, in the old days, I, my understanding was that people only use it in ceremonies. And they didn't abuse it like today. People get addicted to cigarettes. So is that like disrespectful to the old customs and you know to their body? Yeah, it can be construed as disrespect. Uh, uh, I always put it this way: people give tobacco, and you know, uh, there's a great uh, movement here in Saskatchewan started by the government that you can't smoke inside buildings and things like that. It's all part of that mentality of. Uh, these, this present day tobacco that we use is all polluted with all kinds of chemicals, even poisons. And so we understand that. So a lot of people are starting to move away from the use of that kind of tobacco and they're uh, starting to use organic tobacco, naturally grown tobacco. And 
combining it with the original way that they used to make tobacco for pipes, and that was with roots and barks and herbs and all of that sort of thing. So that's beginning to happen. But unfortunately, it's all we have left is this kind of tobacco uh, to, to use in our ceremony. And, and uh, it's uh, unfortunate, but that's all we have. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess it could be construed as disrespectful depending on where you come from. I have a famous little story of, of that. This one elder worked with a group of health people. And I won't say his name, but it's a true story. And he said, you know, all this tobacco we smoke here is not very good for our health. And yeah, that's right, uh, this elder was saying. He was agreeing with them, see? Uh, but he was a big smoker. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, I think I'm going to give up cigarettes. He said, this is not right, not good, not healthy, all that, even though it's our... Uh, we'll just use it in our ceremony. Okay. So, swore off it. Next morning, uh, we met with him, and there was a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. You know? <laughs> and he said, I thought you said you quit smoking. What's that thing you got to hanging out of your mouth? He said, that's a prayer smoke. <laughs> and uh, so they, they asked him, well, how much do you pray? Oh, about a pack a day. <laughs> 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 so... Uh, <laughs> You have, to be, uh, you have to be careful with that kind of stuff. And, uh, like I don't smoke a lot myself, but I like to have a smoke once in a while. I said, and, you know, especially when you go to ceremonies and you know, people are smoking. And, and uh, yeah, uh, all the health indicators are there that it's uh, it's not healthy. And, uh, but at the same time, like I say, it's the only thing we have left of the original tobacco. If we found more of that organic stuff then. Made, it took the time to make that original tobacco. I'm sure we get away from that. But it's a medicine. It may be a polluted medicine today, but it's the only thing we've got left. And uh, so try not to be too harsh in your criticism of these old people that use that kind of tobacco because, like I say, it's all we have left. It's our leading medicine, uh, along with the sage and sweet grass and cedar. Uh, maybe diminished a little because of the poisons in it, but it still represents something. I guess it's the symbology more than, more than anything. And I were constantly reminded when I go into schools by kids, when, uh, like we say, I should always present an elder with tobacco. And they see the teacher giving an elder with tobacco, and the little kids go up here, don't you know that's bad for you? <laughs> I said, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's all we have left, you know. <laughs> so, uh, little kids are very good that way. And uh, so what the teacher said, dress it up, you know, cover it up with a little piece of paper and uh, a little bow or something. You would show the tobacco, then the kids won't give you heck. So, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, but I, I see, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the clean, uh, non-poison tobacco coming back glad to see that. And, uh, uh, but I said, don't be too harsh on the ones that still use that, uh, that, that tobacco, that poison tobacco. That's, that's, all we, that's all we have left in a lot of cases. That's all we have. And some elders are more uh, stringent than others. You know, like I went to a ceremony one time and this elder was given one cigarette and he says, one cigarette, he says. You know how many prayers that's going to get you? He said. Maybe 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you're supposed to give a full package or a full pouch. He says, then you'll get your full prayers. You know, different elders approach these differently. So, uh, depends where you go. Same thing with tobacco. Uh, so, uh, I don't criticize people who, who do or say things like that. I just say, even, even a pinch will satisfy me. Still, it's still false. So it's not how much you get, it's, it's what you're giving. It's still what I'm getting. But like, you're quite right about that tobacco. It's not, it's not a good, healthy thing. So I'm glad to see the movement going back towards again tobacco. Next question.
other people also tell us. Boom! Scared, scared a life out of somebody. Literally, that can, could happen. So, many, many little disciplines, many little sharings like that that you can uh, know about spirit. Where I teach there at the uh, Wabi Mustafa's Healing Center, all of those people, for the most part, have lost touch with their spirits. And we tell them at the end of uh, four weeks, if you learn nothing else but coming out of this place, you will have earned the prayer. Because that means getting in touch with your spirit. And regardless if you're Nakoda, Dakota, Dakota, Mishnabe, maybe out. We're all still praying for the prayer. We respect each other for that. And, and uh, you know, even in Christian churches, I've heard of this. They have prayer circles. And I've heard uh, of those people that, that they held their hands and they prayed for a certain person that was sick. And that person got well. I've heard of those things. You know? And that's the power of prayer. So that First Nations indigenous people do not have a corner on spirituality. A lot, a lot of people are spiritual also. But I'll tell you one thing, we have things in our spirituality that nobody else has in the world. Uh, what's that? Uh, the minister's name is a friend of your uncle Obama. Jesse, where are you? Jesse, Jesse Jackson. You heard of it? Black minister in the United States, very famous, a friend of Barack Obama. Anyway, when he learned that uh, Barack Obama was honored by the Crow people, Native American people of Montana, he said, uh, Barack Obama is very, very uh, appreciative. And I have spoken with him about this and about uh, the gifts of the Native American people, highly indigenous people. Indians or whatever you want to call it. And he said, from my understanding, my knowledge, uh, uh, the people that I know of the Native American uh, spiritual way of life, uh, I know this. And he said, and I passed this on to the president. And that is, no other people in the world other than Native American peoples, us, uh, have the ability communicate with the spirit world and the spirit world to communicate back with them. Nobody else in the world has that. As a people, it might be the odd gifted individual right there who will have that, but nobody else has a people. Nishinaabe uh, people have that, Cree people have that, Lakota, 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 all our peoples have that. So if you go into certain ceremonies, you will hear those spirits talking to you. Talk to you either in, in the language that you're conducting the ceremony. Uh, I've never heard this. We call them grandfathers and grandmothers. I have not heard them speak in English. Maybe some uh, some have, but I have. Uh, mostly they speak in the language in which that ceremony is being conducted. And they'll talk to you. They'll tell you. They'll tell you. They'll be able to predict the future. They'll be able to tell you about. Uh, you know, certain things that are happening. You know, if, you're, if you're broken up with your spouse and you're asked for help, they'll tell you, they'll go help your partner. Things, you know, all kinds of things for, for physical ailments, all <coughs> of those things that are that are asked for, for tobacco and cloth and ribbons and money and whatever else you offer. Uh, those spirits can answer. And uh, I've seen my grandfather uh, as a young child uh, do those kinds of things, and uh, I didn't know whether to believe them or not, you know. I was skeptical in my <coughs> linear thinking, because I grew up in an Indian residential school, and I was taught white people's way. But uh, I was no less in view. I, uh, I, was, uh, I was in awe of what my grandfather So uh, I vowed uh, throughout my life that I would find out about this. 
even if even from just a linear point of view or one point of view, hey, how did he do this? How did this happen? I wanted to know physically how this stuff happened. And uh, later on, of course, uh, it was uh, because I'm spiritual that I wanted to find out. And uh, as I said, I grew up the first seven or eight years of my life with my grandparents and a spiritual perspective. I went to Indian residential school for 11 years. It was beaten out of me. And then I went into politics and I beat it out of myself through drinking and all the rest of it. And then about 30 years ago, I didn't like the way I was living. So I went to have the Fort Knox, my cousin. And he told me, come down here, he says, he says, come and dance. He gave me a whistle. He said, carry this with you. I still have that whistle today. And I followed that way of life ever since. I've had to pass, dance, I went into the mountains to pass. I had, uh, you know, they call that in the movies, uh, vision quest. Uh, I had a vision quest. <laughs> so I did all those things. And uh, I've, I've uh, connected and inter interacted with all kinds of spiritual people, men and women. And I've learned a little bit. And then, of course, as I said, I came back to my own closer to home. And then uh, my, my three elders have, have assisted me and have uh, helped me in the spirit world with gifts. And uh, I now, uh, I guess in the last couple of years, I've been told uh, a creator the grandfathers and the grandmothers are now listening to you. So, not that they weren't before that, but now they're acknowledging. And I'm very grateful for that. But, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one day last summer, we had a violent thunderstorm, lightning, wind, driving rain, very, very, heavy. the trees were just bending over. And my house on the reserve there. Power went out in the evening. Oh, it was very scary. Rain, it was hailing, and it was just a point of it would break the windows and so strong. And I know that the uh, Creator and His helpers, the grandfathers, those are the ones that control those things. So when the power went out there, I had candles around the house, I lit candles, and, uh, just for light, and, uh, no other reason. Then I, I have a room in my house, it's a smudge room. I have all my, I pipe my rattles, my medicines, everything in there. So I went in there. There's no chairs or anything, you sit on the floor. I sat there, I lit my sleep grass, my smudge, and I prayed. And uh, I asked them, help our people, don't hurt our people, things like that. And then uh, it subsided. It, started to get less and less and less and it quit. And you know how after rain it just smells really fresh and really beautiful. So the power was not yet on. My, my uh, candles were lit and I lit up a cigarette and I thought, uh, what should I do here? I? I wanted to go to the bathroom and I didn't want to use my bathroom because I thought I didn't want to you know, use up all my water, or I didn't know that water, the water was not connected to the power, but I thought if I, used, if I flushed my toilet, uh, you know, it wouldn't work anyway, so I went outside. So I uh, came back in, I smudged again. And I thought, oh, it's so nice outside, uh, let's go outside and stand around out there. So I had my cigarette, I was standing out there. It was dark already. And uh, standing there in front of my truck, I was smoking. I thought there was a couple of little lights like that. I thought those were fireflies, you know what fireflies are. And uh, I went up there, you know, trying to grab nothing. <laughs> no fireflies, so. Gee, I wonder, I wonder what this is. Kind of little blue lights. Like so then I saw them, they started going down towards my corral there where I keep my horses, my uh, cat shop, and my horse shop. And 
I saw them lighting up there again. Then they went further and they were lighting up over there again. I thought, boy, these fireflies are sure active tonight. <laughs> you know? And then they start coming back towards where I was standing. I have a little driveway there. There's quite a bush there. This is uh, this is something that's it's not fireflies. I said that to myself. That I was smoking, and then I asked aloud, "Eh, here, Chioma, Musumna, is this you, grandfathers?" So as I said that, it's like they started lighting up faster. And I thought, "Yeah, must be that." They must have heard my prayers. I said. I kind of got the chills now. I don't know what you know, scared me up as hard <laughs> inside my house. Close the door. <laughs> and, uh, well, ten minutes later, the lights came on. And, uh, so I, I uh, phoned a couple of my relatives, elders, that uh, follow these ways, and I asked them, and I got messages, texts, and uh, sure enough, they start texting me back. I said, this is grandfather they had just come, they showed you their power. You know, they were letting me know that they heard their voice. That's why they were fighting. I thought, oh boy. I thought, oh goodness. That they would they would listen. They would hear me. They would hear my words. And that they would show themselves. Not in a physical apparition or anything, just by that light those lights. And that's been happening to me since in ceremonies. Going to a sweat lodge uh, and it's starting to happen more and more now. Like sing certain songs to certain grandfathers, the least the bear spirit or the horse spirit. <coughs> One time I sang that to song of Sanctuary. And some of these people, and not everybody sees the same thing or hears the same thing or feels the same thing. One person told me he heard a horse in there. Must have been one who sang that horse spirit song. And the last what, last Thursday, uh, a couple of them told me who heard that bear. So we sang a, a, a song that uh, bears a healing spirit and those people needed healing. So we sang that song. And they heard that bear going around in their ground. And they saw those legs. I saw one man with, uh, you know, with that uh, Star Trek. One of those guys has the glasses like this that light up. I saw that on a man in there. And uh, with my eyes down, I started looking and I looked because I thought maybe I couldn't see right without my glasses. And I looked and there it was again. I told him after that, you know, that man. So, <coughs> and, uh, so things like that, you know, those are very spiritual. Those are. Those don't just happen just because. It happens because you try to live a discipline in your life about the spiritual way. And a lot of people scoff at that, you know. They say, ah, that's just hocus pocus. You know? That's magic, they call that. that you know, read some anthropologist reports, they call that magic. Judgmen, you know, use their magic. That's what they call it. So, uh, now uh, we've lived the history of people putting down a spiritual way of life. That's just one more example. But until you, you uh, experience that yourself and you see that and you feel that, and all of that, that's about spirituality and that's get in touch with the Creator and ask the Creator's help us. You know. That's what that's all about. I got a question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, earlier you were talking about the power of intention intention, you know, like when you're healing people. And I was told when I practice the Anishinaabe language, I have to speak from the diaphragm, right, as opposed to just up here where it's intellectual. But could you uh, speak a bit more about intention and your speaking with conviction and what well that does? I don't know about that stuff so much. I've heard about that. All I know is what I've been told uh, by old people and the old man who gave me that pipe. You don't speak from your diaphragm or here, you speak from here. And you speak from here. And you never conduct or 
go into a ceremony angry or uh, you know mad at somebody or something that you uh, you all still with a good heart and that you should even refuse tobacco if you're if you're angry or somebody has hurt you and you can't find it in yourself to pray for them don't take that tobacco that's what I've been told Unfortunately, I've never had to do that, but uh, that's, that's a leading teaching. You don't, uh, don't conduct ceremonies or you're like that. You have to be of a good mind and a kind mind and a humble mind. You have to go into that. And speaking from the heart, uh, speaking from your spirit. I don't know about these two things, but I only know about this. I've been told in, in my teachings. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Wayne, for your words and your wisdom. And it's very much appreciated. And uh, we'd love to have you in. And you know, we have been other times, so it's, it's quite a little down if you want to hear. Well, there's another opportunity if you want to talk to others. Start with the He's actually, we're actually going to go over the book awards. So hang around there if you guys are all invited. If you want. Lots more if you want. <laughs> but uh, there's a, uh, <coughs> if you want to see like a lot of the books that are coming out, there's some books and other things. Okay.